So, um, hi, good afternoon. I'm Wing Yuan, and um, I, I'm from Johns Hopkins University. Uh, today, I'll be talking about a project that I'm very excited uh, working on is trying to uh, construct a cosmological perturbation solver uh, for mass neutrinos uh, without using the Boltzmann hierarchy. Um, this work is uh, done in collaboration with Mark Kanankowski, and the results will appear very soon in the, in the next couple of weeks in the paper. Um, so what is cosmological perturbation theory? Um, it's, it's basically a theory that uh, solves the perturbations in um, that evolves the primordial quantum fluctuations from the early universe to the present day uh, in homogeneities and uh, anisotropies that we, that we observe. Um, at its at its core, it is actually solving a coupled set of uh, linearized Einstein equations <coughs> and Boltzmann equations for the radiation and matter, uh, with um, almost uh, fifty years of development. Uh, the code now is very fast for a single run. It typically takes orders of uh, seconds or um, or tens of seconds. But it's still um, but this but it's still crucially important for this code for this code to be fast uh, because they play a fundamental role in the interpret in the, in the interpretation of cosmological data. Sorry, uh -huh. I obviously wasn't prepared for that. You go ahead. I, I just try. Oh, OK, so because they are crucially important in the interpretation of cosmological data. Um, so let's say we observe the universe, uh, no matter it's um, the CMB or the large scale structure or the weak lensing or some other probe. Um, we oh, what, what we will do uh, next is then use this algorithm um, tens to hundreds of thousands of times to uh, explore the landscape of the likelihood function of those observations, and then determine the cosmological parameters and uh, hopefully harmful new physics. So um, this process of running the code uh, thousands, um, tens of thousands to hundreds, hundreds of thousands of times, typically will take several CPU days. So, um, it is, so it is still crucial, although one run of the code is fast, so it's but it's still crucial to improve the code uh, if we can. So here is a little uh, short history for the experts in the room uh, of uh, the history of the development of cosmological perturbation solvers. So uh, Lifshitz at uh, 1946 first uh, initially developed the theory and uh, Mayan Bershinger um, is probably at 1995 provides the first publicly av available code for calculating the cosmological perturbations called Cosmix. Um, and then uh, Seljak and uh, Matinas, who I believe is also on this call, uh, one year later developed uh, the very famous CMB fast, which uses the line of sight formalism to uh, greatly accelerate the calculation of um, uh, the CMB anisotropies. Uh, the current day popular solutions uh, include a code um, include codes called class camp and CMB easy. Uh, they are slightly modularized than earlier codes and easier to um, uh, relatively easier to use and implement new features. Uh, earlier this year uh, in 2021, uh, Mark Kamenkowski actually uh, published a paper showing that photons Boltzmann hierarchy. Uh, the photons Boltzmann hierarchies actually can be replaced. Uh, by just the several integral equations um, that will, uh, on top of the uh, line of sight formalism, will accelerate the code for probably about five to ten times. And in this work, what I'm going to pre be presenting is to show that the massive neutrinos Boltzmann hierarchies um, can actually be replaced by integrals, mere integrals, not integral equations. And this uh, observation will allow substantial extra simplifications on top of the photon case pre uh, presented by Kamiankowski earlier this year. Uh, and we think that this new method for neutrino is very promising. Um, okay, so let's pull back a little bit and think about um, how is the business traditionally been done. Uh, this is uh, a typical on the left hand side is a typical ordinary differential equation system solved um, uh, by the solver for a cosmology with uh, cold dark matter, baryon, photon, and neutrino. Um, 
three generations of massive neutrinos, that is. Um, as you can already tell, uh, the distribution of the equations that we spent on different species is very uneven. So we spend two equations for the Einstein equations, we spend one equation for the cold dark matter, two equations for the baryon uh, over density and baryon velocity, and we spend 40 equations for the two photon hierarchies, and uh, we spend almost 300 equations for the neutrino hierarchy. So obviously, the solver spends most of the time on the neutrino hierarchy. So in the rest of the talk, I will talk about uh, why do we have the neutrino hierarchies <coughs> and uh, how can we potentially avoid the hierarchy? And then can we use this knowledge to construct a faster solver? Um, so first, uh, we need to understand why we need to use the Boltzmann equations. So the Boltzmann equations actually comes from the need of describing hot and warm species uh, in the universe. Um, Normally, when you, did, when you describe cold species, when the, when the temperature is smaller than the particle mass of the species, um, examples of this are cold dark matter and baryon, um, the system is completely described by the fluid equations. Um, you know, that is the familiar uh, nabla mu, t mu, nu equals dj mu. Uh, if, the, if, the, <coughs> sorry, if the species is collisionless, then uh, the momentum flux j mu is just zero. So this will give you Mm, two coupled fluid equations in the scalar case. Um, but when the species is warm or hot, which means that the temperature of the species is uh, higher than or comparable to the particle mass of the species. Um, it, it, for example, um, this, uh, when the species is massless or when the species is light, for example, neutrinos and photons, or in some uh, other uh, extensions to the lambda CDM model, uh, where you have a non-cold dark matter relic, um, in those cases, the higher moments of the, of the distribution function cannot be ignored. So we actually need the full Boltzmann equation to describe uh, the evolution of the system. And then what about Boltzmann hierarchy? Boltzmann hierarchy actually comes from casting the Boltzmann equation into multiple forms. So here, what I'm showing is the Boltzmann equation. Um, and psi here um, is uh, the perturbation around the equilibrium uh, distribution function in the neutrino case is the Fermi Dirac distribution function. Um, and then you can decompose uh, the, um, the spatial depend, uh, sorry, the directional de dependence of psi, which is you know, the pattern of uh, where uh, of the distribution of where the neutrino is propagating into this monopole pattern and amplitude, into this dipole pattern and the amplitude quadruple pattern and this amplitude and octable and so on and so forth. If you then plot this decomposition back into the Boltzmann equation, you will get um, the famous Boltzmann hierarchy. So the hierarchy is essentially saying that um, the evolution of the ELF multiple is being sourced by adjacent multiples, that is the L minus one multiple and L plus one multiple. And of course, because um, neutrinos also interact gravitationally, so it is also sourced by um, the gravitational perturbation. So here, H and eta are the um, synchronous gauge uh, metric perturbations. Um, without going too much into details, you can just think about this as gravity. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this equation is actually a coupled infinite tower of equations. Um, so you know, here you have the monopole that is coupled to dipole, uh, and you have the dipole that is coupled to monopole and uh, quadrupole. You have the quadrupole coupled to coupled to dipole and octopole, and so on and so forth. It's an infinite tower of uh, coupled ordinary differential equations. And at the bottom of the tower, you have um, the the uh, you have the uh, monopole and uh, the quadrupole talking to gravity, and of course the gravity talking with the rest of the system. Uh, that includes the cold dark matter, photon, baryon, or some other extensions of lambda CDM. Um, and uh, if you want to describe massive neutrinos, then the situation is uh, is even worse because you you don't need only you, you, so only one um, infinite tower is not enough. You need an infinitude of these infinite towers. Uh, just to sample the momentum continuum of the neutrino, because if the neutrino is massive, then you, you of course, you, you still care about where it's moving, but now you also care about how fast it's moving. 
So you, you will need an infinitude of this infinite towers. Um, if you have three generations of massive neutrinos, then you need three infinitudes of this infinite tower. Obviously, uh, this is not computationally feasible. Um, uh, in the past uh, 25 years, people have come up with very clever um, algorithms and uh, approximations um, to reduce this problem. Now, practically, this whole system is being truncated, typically at, uh, the, at the order 20 for the height of the infinite tower, for the height of one infinite tower. And we typically will use five momentum samples um, to sample the momentum continuum. Um, well, this, this is, again, uh, depends on the target accuracy you want to have. Uh, and if you have three copies of the whole thing, um, it amounts to uh, the 300 couple differential equations that I mentioned um, previously in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the pie chart. So um, this is actually, um, if we think about this, this is actually a, a price that is um, a little high to pay to just describe neutrinos free, freely streaming and interacting gravitationally. So uh, we would like to take another look at um, the Boltzmann equations. So here, instead of just directly casting the Boltzmann equations into multiple forms, what we do is we integrate, we, we first treat the Boltzmann equation as a first order differential equation for Psi as a function of time, conformal time tau. And then we can integrate this ordinary differential equation from tau i to tau f. Um, so this idea, so this is the result. This idea is actually very simple, uh, very similar to the to what uh, was done in the line of sight formalism for the photons. Um, but um, there are two differences that I want to point out. First difference is that because photon is massless, the neutrino is massive. So um, the neutrino horizon defined here, and that also appears on the on the exponents, um, is not the conform is not proportional to conformal time. That is, uh, is nonlinear in conformal time that is given by this integral. The second difference is that um, neutrino Boltzmann equation is collisionless. So um, this is different than photon. Photon has Thomson scatterings uh, that, is, um, that is coupling uh, photons multiples to itself. So because neutrino is collisionless, on the, on the integral part of this solution, there's only metric. So the only metric perturbation, um, the, the uh, photon, uh, sorry, the neutrino distribution does not appear on the right-hand side in the integral. This is actually a very important observation and which will lead to um, massive simpli simplification of the problem. So um, if, we then, if we then take this, for, uh, uh, if we then take this result and then cast this result then into the multiple form, we arrive at the central uh, result that allows us to construct a hierarchyless solver. So here, uh, it tells us that at the final time tau f, multiple l is given by a linear combination of all the initial multiples at tau i, plus a convolution uh, between gravity, which is blue here, um, and uh, a nullen kernel function, uh, which is the JL, the Bessel function, and the JL prime prime, which is the second derivative of the Bessel function. Um, so how can we use this to construct a hierarchical solver? We, if we take tau i to be sufficiently early, uh, ideally close to neutrino decoupling, then at that time, neutrino, uh, neutrino still uh, hasn't have time to develop its higher moments yet. So we can then reduce uh, this infinite sum to only three terms, psi zero, psi one, and psi two. And then we can fix tau i and then evolve tau f using this integral um, you know, from tau i to, to today's conformal time. And then uh, we evolve this uh, equations with the rest of the system, and then we can avoid the Boltzmann hierarchy. We avoid the Boltzmann hierarchy simply because there's no multi there's no multiple coupling uh, after initial condition. Remember, we take the initial time to be sufficiently early, um, and uh, the the evolution part, which is given by the convolution, 
actually does not have any other, other multiples appearing. So um, we don't have any hierarchy in this scenario. And also the second um, point I want to make um, is why this is simpler than the photon case uh, de uh, developed by Kamiankowski early this year is because that this result is merely an integral, not an integral equation, which means that uh, you know, the, the multiple of neutrino does not appear in this integral. So uh, after knowing how gravity behaves, we can just evaluate this integral uh, without having to use uh, an integral equation solver to actually tell you what is the, uh, what is the evolution of the neutrino multiples. This is good, but there's no free lunch, obviously. We now need to evolve a hybrid system of integrals plus ordinary differential equations, integrals describing the neutrinos and uh, ordinary differential equations describing the gravity and the rest of the system. We choose to, so this is sort of a chicken and egg problem um, because obviously to, to evaluate uh, the multiple, you will need to know gravity, but then gravity, the evolution of gravity also depends on the value of the multiples of neutrino in, in part depends on the evolution of the multiples of the neutrino. So we choose to do this iteratively. So what we do is we take, um, um, so this equation is true for every L, but we only take the monopole and, uh, monopole and dipole case simply because that's what's, uh, what the neutrino sector is talking to gravity uh, through. Um, so what we do is we take two simple onsets for the neutrino, uh, neutrino monopole and dipole evolution. We then solve the rest of the system, um, treating, uh, treating the onsets as a true solution. And then we can have uh, the evolution of the gravity parameters, that is the uh, metric perturbation. And then we can use the integral here to update um, the evolution of the neutrino multiples. And we do this iteratively until the target precision um, is achieved. Um, so here is a short comparison. Uh, what we have done is basically reducing this infinite tower of hierarchies um, into just two integrals uh, evolving together with the rest of the ordinary differential equation system via iterative, via, via an iterative process. Okay, so some proof of concept code that shows the, that shows that this actually works. Uh, we uh, on the on the left panel, I'm showing the convergence of the iterative process for the neutrino monopole. Um, we start so uh, here the color coding is from the lightest blue to the darkest blue. Is the uh, is you go from the initial condition, initial onsets of the of the iteration to the final converged solution. So here we start with the worst possible initial onsets, that is no neutrino perturbation. And then you can see that just after one iteration, um, the, uh, the new solver actually, uh, the, the, the evolution actually assumes the um, most features uh, of, the, of the true solution. And then after two to three um, uh, more iterations, um, the iterative process is refining the solution and making uh, the final result very close to the converged solution. Uh, and the bottom panel here is the, is, is the difference between the result of each iteration to the final converged solution. So we are basically getting one to two order of magnitude um, in, in, increase in precision for each iteration. Uh, on the right hand here, uh, on the right hand side here, what I'm showing is a comparison between the converged solution, which is the last uh, solution on the left hand side, um, a comparison of that to the to the results from the Boltzmann hierarchy. Um, the the neutrino the the, uh, the converged solution is in blue and the Boltzmann hierarchy is in black. I don't know if you can tell they are actually uh, completely overlapping, and uh, the bottom panel is um, the difference between those two. So you can you can also demonstrate I can also demonstrate this for the neutrino dipole because we are evolving both together. Uh, for the dipole, if we start at uh, uh, zero onsets, 
uh, you will see that the solver actually, the iterative process actually constructs this oscillatory feature very, very quickly, but overshoots in terms of amplitude. It corrects itself a little bit, but a little bit too much. And then it corrects itself a little, little bit, but uh, a little bit too much again. And then finally converges to the, uh, to the true solution. And uh, on the right hand side, uh, again, is the comparison between uh, the solver that is proposed here and uh, a traditional Boltzmann hierarchy solver. Um, so I have demonstrated that the hierarchy list solver actually converges very fast to very accurate solutions, even without any information from the ansatz. That is, if we start with no neutrino perturbation and do the iterative process, it's also it's, it's also it's also converges very fast and uh, to very accurate solutions. But of course, you don't need to do that. You can, if you can provide more information in the initial onsets of the iterative process, you will need less iteration. So uh, we propose two ways to do this. The first way is to do a trial solution with a neutrino shear model or a shorter hierarchy, basically any model that can tell you. Uh, maybe not exactly, but uh, roughly what the what the monopole and dipoles are behaving. Uh, if you use that as the starting case, then um, you can reduce the number of iterations you you need. And uh, the second case is uh, a little a little bit more compelling because most of the time um, these codes are not performed in isolation, so they are uh, they are most of the time they are used in what is called a Markov chain Monte Carlo. Um, sampling of the of the posterior, so you are actually evaluating um, two models very close in the theoretical parameter space, and uh, presumably they will have very similar neutrino neutrino evolutions. So for the neutrino evolution from the previous step is probably a very good answer for the starting point of the iteration iteration for the next uh, for the next the models. So. Uh, here is a quick example showing uh, the first possibility. Uh, on the left-hand side is the zero onsets case that I showed. This is for neutrino monopole. And on the right-hand side, I have this um, starting point to be um, a Boltzmann hierarchy, but only with uh, monopole, dipole, quadrupole, and octopole. So a, a Boltzmann hierarchy that is cut at L equals to three. As you can see that this, Starting on source is is um, is not the exact solution, obviously, but it uh, already has you know the oscillatory features that uh, will be a very good starting point for the, for the iterative process to work on and refine on. So as you can tell from the from the difference uh, uh, from the convergence in the bottom panels, um, it requires less uh, iterative steps to achieve the same accuracy. Uh, here is the same the same thing that is shown for the, the neutrino dipole. Uh, as you can see, uh, the shorter hierarchy answers establishes uh, correctly the amplitude um, of the uh, of the solution. So the so so not like in the zero uh, in the zero answers case, the sol the solver has to has to try and correct itself for that for for the uh, for the um, uh, and for the amplitude. But here. Uh, it just needs to refine a little bit on the oscillatory features. So here is another. Uh, so here is the second scenario, where we use um, the result from the previous MCMC step as the answer for the next uh, uh, for the next iterative process. Uh, here we are using the true solution for the 0.6 eV neutrino as the initial answer for the 0 0.06 eV neutrino. Uh, as you can see, as you can see that the onsource is already very close to the true solution. So I don't, I don't think you can tell the difference on this plot, but but nonetheless, you can see that uh, the first several iterations already give uh, far better results uh, when compared to the zero onsource case. Five minutes. Five more minutes. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm on time. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah. Okay. So this is the same uh, thing that but shown for dipole uh, again. Um, I don't know if you, you can tell the difference because for those two models, um, the true solutions are very close anyways. So this is why this method is, uh, this scenario is really powerful is because when you vary in the, in the, in the model space, 
most of the time you are not jumping um, terribly far. You are you are just uh, uh, moving around at the best bit value. The second optimization uh, that we can do uh, is we can optimize how we do the integral. So we are evolving the integrals with the rest of the system that is being described by the ordinary differential equations. Now, by evolving the integrals, what I meant is that we fix the initial tau i and we move tau f from tau i to today's time with, let's say, n time, step, n time steps. Um, for each of those n time steps, you will need to evaluate uh, this integral um, that is basically you know, a convolution between gravity and kernel functions. It would be great if you can do this faster. Um, the first possibility is that we can evaluate this individually for each n of the integrals via a quadrature rule that is optimized for highly oscillatory integrands uh, because this JL and JL prime prime is highly oscillatory. So if you already have this knowledge, then you can use less sample points in the metric perturbations um, to give the same um, results at the same accuracy um, for, for, the, for the results of the integral. But a far more compelling uh, scenario is actually to use a single convolution via fast Fourier transform to evaluate this integral. So this integral is, can actually be written as a Laplace um, convolution. Um, and uh, that can be calculated just in one go parallelly uh, for all the n time steps by one fast Fourier transformation. And this, um, again, I want to point out that this massive simplification is not possible with photons because for photons, you will have uh, the photon monopole and photon quadruple appearing in the integral. So in that case, you will need to, so in that case, that's, that's a, a, what we call a bona fide um, integral equation, a Volterra equation, uh, if we, uh, technically speaking, uh, and you will need uh, specially designed solvers for that. But for this, it's just a simple fast Fourier transformation. So that's why we think um, this work on neutrino can greatly increase um, the speed of the current solvers. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Um, so in this talk, I showed the massive neutrino Boltzmann hierarchy can actually be replaced by two integrals. Um, proposed to use the iterative process to evolve this hybrid system of integrals plus ordinary differential equations uh, and show that it actually works very well. Um, and uh, we discussed uh, two ways to optimize this, one by optimizing the initial answers, the other by optimizing the integration method. In the process, I have emphasized um, the extra substantial simplifications that, that is all impossible with massive neutrinos, but not with photons. And since massive neutrino is taking up most of the computation time anyways, so we think that uh, um, this, um, this new solver has a lot of potential. So the next steps is actually, so first we want to do a proper benchmark, right? So we want to count how many floating point operations are actually being saved for a given target accuracy. And after this, we, we want to integrate our solver into class or CAM, uh, simply because uh, you know, solving cosmological perturbations theory is just uh, one step in the whole pipeline, among other steps like MCMC sampling, calculation of the calculation of the spectrum and so on and so forth. So if we, if we do the integration, we will make our algorithm more readily available to the community. Um, thanks. Thank you very much for a super nice talk. Um, I think in the interest of time, I would say that any questions we will um, address to you later or by email afterwards. Yeah. And I think it would be, I think best if we just go to our second speaker for the day. Um, you want to share your screen? Yeah, oh, sorry, and I forgot, yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, let's stop sharing.
Thank you very much for being here and please take it away. Oh, okay. Oh, can you can you guys hear me well? Okay. Yeah, so my name is Xiao Han. I'm a grad student from Harvard. Uh, I work mainly on realization. Yeah, so today's talk is going to be about realization. And I'm going to talk about the imprint of deionization on the CMD and the laminar forest. So let's get started with what is hydrogen reionization. So basically, we know from theory that the universe is neutral shortly after the Big Bang. And we also know from observations of the low redshift universe that the universe is highly ionized. So there must be something happening in between that deionizes the universe. So that epoch is called the epoch of deionization. It is generally believed that stars were the sources of ionizing photons that made reionization possible, but much is still unknown about how reionization occurred exactly. And there are two major observables of reionization currently. One is the large scale CMB E mode polarization. So uh, this basically explains how uh, the reionization process leaves an imprint on the CMB. Uh, the idea is that a free electron can scatter all the CMB photons out to a cause of horizon distance away. And that's illustrated by the plot on the left here. Uh, and then if there is quadruple anisotropy in the radiation background, then after the Thomson scattering, we would expect to see uh, anisotropy in the CMB E mode polarization. Uh, so that anisotropy will occur on angular scales that correspond to the horizon scale at the time of scattering. And that scale, uh, the angular scale is usually characterized by this small l here. So roughly one over L or pi over L is the horizon scale at the time of scattering divided by the distance to the uh, time of scattering. So if we look at the CMB emo per spectrum shown on the right here, we would see this so-called reionization bump feature shown by the blue line here. Uh, so you can see that the, this reionization bump corresponds to like pretty low L. So that corresponds to large angular scales. And the idea here is that the shape and height of the reionization bump roughly uh, uh, is roughly sensitive to the midpoint of reionization. So from the uh, from measuring the low LCMB E per spectrum, we can roughly constrain the midpoint of reionization. And then the second major observable of reionization currently is the laminar forest. So the first arises from the lamin alpha absorption of neutral hydrogen atoms along the line of sight. So here's a very simple toy model that explains how the force comes into being. So we have a source of light here, which is a quasar. As the light from the quasar comes from the quasar to us, it will encounter several of these gas clouds in between. So the neutral hydrogen atoms inside each of the gas clouds will absorb the laminar photon that they see corresponding to their redshift and therefore leaves uh, that leaves a uh, lemon alpha absorption line in the quasar continuum. So you can see there are like multiple lemon alpha absorption lines in the quasar continuum. Uh, so in reality, we don't see these distinct gas clouds. We actually see a continuously fluctuating intergalactic medium with pretty low density. And so that really forms a forest of lemon alpha absorption lines. And that's shown by the real observations here. So you really, you really see like these forest of lemon alpha lines, and this is the lemon alpha forest. Uh, the idea here is that the cross-section between lemon alpha photon and neutral hydrogen is pretty high. And so the fact that we see the lemon alpha forest already means that the universe is highly ionized. And so this puts a lower limit on the endpoint of reionization. So in this talk, I'm going to dig more into these two observ observables of reionization see what else we can constrain from uh, reionization of uh, constrain reionization from these two observables. 
So I'll talk, uh, I'll divide the talk into two parts. In the first, in the first part, I'll talk about uh, how we can constrain POP3 reionization at redshift larger than 15 using the CMB. And in the second part, I'm going to talk about how we can constrain patchy reionization using the Laman chorus. So I'll probably stop very briefly in between for questions about the first part. Uh, but let's first get started with POP3 and the CMB. So first of all, uh, let's just briefly review uh, POP3 star formation. Uh, so POP3 also called the first generation stars. These are metal free stars. So uh, POP3 are believed to uh, form in 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 6 solar mass halos at around redshift 2030-ish. At that time, there were no metals in the universe, so the gap had to rely on the formation and cooling of molecular hydrogen to form the first generation of stars. Because uh, the cooling of molecular hydrogen cannot cool the, cool the gas down to very low temperatures, the resulting POP3 stars are pretty massive, something like a border 100 solar masses. After the formation of POP3, they form Lana Warner photons, which are photons just below the energy level of uh, the ionization level of hydrogen. So these photons will photodissociate molecular hydrogen, which basically means that the formation of POP3 is suicidal because these stars had to rely on the formation of molecular hydrogen to form, but then they destroy the rest of the molecular hydrogen capable of forming other POP3 stars. So we say that POP3 star formation self-regulates and the star formation rate density never gets to very high values. So we estimate that POP3 stars can only ionize the universe at a uh, redshift larger than 15 to about 1 to 10% level. So the rest of the uh, reionization process is completed by POP2, the metal enriched, uh, metal enriched stars. So how does POP3 reionization leave an imprint on the CMB? Well, let's come back to this um, reionization bump plot here. Uh, so the idea is that for ionization events happening at higher redshifts, those anisotropy in the E mode will correspond to smaller angular scales uh, because the ionization events are further away from us and the horizon scales are also smaller uh, compared to low Z ionization. So if there is significant ionization by POP3 at redshift larger than 15, then we would expect to see more angular anisotropy at L of about 10 to 20-ish. So these are like slightly smaller angular scales compared to the entire reionization bump. So uh, at the end of the day, the kind of observable that we care about is this uh, Thomson scattering optical depth at Z larger than 15. So the Thomson scattering optical depth is basically an integral along, along the line of sight, the free electron number density times the Thomson scattering cross-section. So in this talk, I'm also gonna uh, refer to the total tau, which you can also call tau of C larger than zero or the total Thomson scattering optical depth throughout reionization. So I'll talk about both these two things, uh, but um, all in all, uh, if there is significant ionization by POP3 at high Z, then what we would expect to see is this increased angular anisotropy at slightly higher L and a non-zero detection of this tau Z larger than 15. So my question in this project is very simple. Uh, basically, will CMB measurements of this tau Z larger than 15 be helpful in constraining POP3 models? And you see a little bit of a spoiler here. The uh, answer is actually no. So I'll talk about how we got to this conclusion. Uh, but the important thing to mention here is that POP3 modeling is highly uncertain. You can basically add various ingredients together to form uh, the most complicated POP3 model ever. Uh, but that's not really the point here. Uh, so basically what we want to do is just that we want to build a simplest possible physically motivated POP3 model and see how much they can ionize the high Z universe and how much of an imprint can that leave on the low LCMB. So to build a simplest possible physically motivated POP3 model, we basically just need two ingredients, uh, two most important ingredients. One is star formation. 
and the other is lemma one or feedback, which closely associate molecular hydrogen. Uh, so there are uh, two free parameters involved in here. One is the star formation efficiency, and the other is the strength of the lemma one or feedback. So that basically refers to this minimum halo mass for pop three star formation, uh, which we manipulate. Um, uh, by manip manip manipulating a fitting formula from this uh, uh, pretty state-of-the-art model in the literature. And then if we iterate between these two ingredients, we can get the resulting pop 3 star formation rates, and therefore the uh, how many ions and photons are emitted, and therefore the resulting reionization history. So that's the idea here. And we want to vary these two free parameters as wildly as possible so that we can explore a very wide range of parameter space of pop 3 star formation, and therefore explore all possible reionization histories. So the result of this exploration of parameter space is shown by this pretty beautiful rainbow plot here. So I'm not going to go into details of this plot, but basically uh, each single line in this plot corresponds to one pop 3 model uh, with one set of pop 3 parameters. And then the important thing to mention here is just that we require the models to complete reionization by redshift five and, five and a half. So this is the endpoint of reionization constraint by the laminar forest. And then uh, in the end, what we eventually care about is this delta chi squared value of the E per spectra. So basically what we did is that uh, for each POP3 model, we compared the E per spectrum to a POP2 only model with the same total tau. Uh, and then we calculate the delta chi squared value of the E power spectra in the cosmic variance limit. So cosmic variance limit basically means we are able to observe the full sky. But even in this limit, we don't get zero error bar because of finite mode counting. And so what the delta chi squared value tells us is just that um, distinguishability of POP3 models compared to POP2 only models uh, in the ideal uh, all sky limit. So the result of our calculation is shown here. Uh, here I'm showing the delta chi squared value of POP3 versus POP2 as a function of the total tau. And then the points are color coded by the tau deduction 15 value. Uh, so the redder the color is, the higher the tau deduction 15 value is. And immediately you can see that uh, as we increase this tau deduction 15, we are also increasing the delta chi squared. So that is pretty much expected because as we increase the level of ionization at high B, we are also increasing the level of anisotropy in the E mode polarization at higher L. So the POP3 models get more distinguishable from POP2 only models. So if we draw a line of delta chi squared equals four here, uh, above this line, this basically means the models are distinguishable from POP2 only models by at least two sigma level. So you see that that corresponds to a uh, tau deduction 15 threshold of about 0 0.08. However, if we restrict the models to be consistent with the Planck total tau, and that's restricted by these two black dash lines here, then we see that these models are not allowed to have higher, uh, to have very high tau uh, deduction 15. So what this is basically saying is that the low total tau constraint by Planck and the endpoint of reionization constraint by the forest already ruled out most of the pop three parameter space without actually the need to invoke this tau deduction 15 constraint. So the reason is just that the high D structure formation plus one one or feedback model makes it really hard to get very extended reionization at high D. So what's, uh, what this is all saying is just that uh, very simple that uh, CMB surveys um, especially future CMB surveys, uh, all sky surveys, looking at the low L CMP is very unlikely to help us constrain pop three models. So that's like the one most important thing that I want you to remember from this part of the talk. And then I think I'm gonna uh, pause very briefly here and uh, for questions. Yes. Okay. Should I think of another question? Uh, so it looks like you, you did not consider the escape fraction of M um, continuum. I guess it assumes 100% escaped. So we, we do have um, escape fraction from POP2. Uh, 
uh, for pop theory, we just assume it's one uh, because it's highly uncertain anyways. And then for pop two, we vary the escape fraction, but that's basically just uh, changing like the pop two reanalyzation part, like shifting the, the reanalyzation midpoint. Thank you. Um, so the difference between population three and population two would be, I guess, two main things. One is when they formed in the universe history, and the second would be their composition. And it looks like you're saying that most of this is driven by the time in which they formed, like this kind of difference here, and less their actual composition of the star during the reanimation. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure if I get the question correct, but I think like the most important difference on the reanimation history is like. The, the shape of the reanimation history sure. that they uh, that they cause, like for pop three, we believe it's probably flatter than pop two, mm -hmm. and then pop two is like much more rapid. Okay, and is that difference we believe just a function of the stars are made of different things, or is it more of uh, these stars came earlier, so the shape's going to be different, and these other stars came later, so the shape's going to be different. Different ways. I think it's a combined effect of different things. Um, the kind of feedback channels are a bit different, so the star formation histories are different. And I think that's the, the major cause of the, the shape of the reanimation history being different. I think I would say let's just move on because we have only yes. 10 more minutes, so I think. Um, all questions afterwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Sorry. Yeah, so I'm going to move on to talking about patchy reanimation and the laminar forest. So before we talk about laminar forest, uh, or actually the temperature fluctuations uh, from patchy reanimation, let's first uh, briefly introduce the IGM gamma history. So here on the right, you're seeing a very uh, simple toy problem illustrating the uh, IGM gamma history. This is showing the temperature of the IGM at mean density as a function of redshift. So let's imagine that the whole universe is suddenly ionized at redshift nine. And so the IGM will be photoheated all of a sudden to of about uh, over 20,000 Kelvin. And then after the photoheating, the IGM is going to cool down, mainly because of adiabatic cooling due to Hubble expansion and constant cooling off of the CMB. So this blue line you see here is what we call the IGM thermal history. So now let's imagine that different parts of the universe are ionized at different times. Then for each patch in the universe, we can have its own thermal history. So at the end of the whole reanimation process, we might expect to see temperature fluctuations because of this different parts of the universe being ionized at different times. So that's basically illustrated by the uh, visualization at the bottom here. So this is a visualization of a, a reanimation simulation that I ran a few years ago from left to right. This is showing a snapshot from redshift eight and a half to redshift six. Uh, so the lighter the color is, the higher the temperature is. And then uh, basically you see that for this patch that is ionized the earliest, it has the lowest temperature after reanimation. And for this patch that is ionized the latest, it has the highest temperature after reanimation. So it is generally believed that patch reanimation causes this order unity fluctuations in the uh, IGM temperature after reanimation. So this might have an impact on the statistics of the laminar forest that we are able to measure. Uh, and so the kind of statistics that we care about is the uh, power spectrum of the laminar flux. So uh, I'm going to explain how temperature changes the laminar forest flux per, uh, power spectrum here. Uh, so here, basically, in the top panel, you're seeing uh, a mock laminar forest absorption from a simulation. In the bottom panel, this is the power spectrum of absorption. So that's basically taking the Fourier transform of the top panel and squaring the amplitude. So I'm going to play this movie, and it's going to show the effect of varying the IGM temperature. 
so as you can see, when the IgM temperature is okay, it's stuck. Uh, as you can see, when the IgM temperature is higher, the absorption lines are broader uh, because of the thermal broadening of the lines. And so that's going to smear out some of the small scale structure in the forest. So you would see, uh, this is really bad. Yeah, so, so you would see uh, less small scale power when the IgM temperature is higher. And then conversely, when the IgM temperature is lower, you would expect to see more small scale power uh, because there's more small scale structure in the forest. So that's the basic idea and it's pretty stuck. Yeah, but anyways, uh, temperature fluctuations from patchy reionization might complicate this, pic uh, this picture. Uh, so let's take a look at this very simple toy model here. So this is showing the flux power spectrum of the forest again. And then let's imagine that the blue line is the flux power spectrum of the universe where the gas is cold. And so it has more small scale power. And then the red line is the flux power spectrum of the, of the universe where the universe is hot. So there is less small scale power. So in a combined universe where the gas is like 50% uh, cold, 50% hot, then the flux power spectrum of this combined universe might look like the magenta line shown here. So we see that this is nothing like a universe where there is a single temperature. So this might complicate uh, current IgM temperature measurements or warm dark matter, quasi dark matter constraints, uh, because these are these constraints are obtained by assuming uniform reionization models. So if temperature fluctuations from patchy reionization may bias the shape of the uh, forest flux per spectrum at small scales, then these measurements will also likely be biased. And then on the other hand, there is another effect on the large scale end. So here the idea is that the large scale temperature fluctuations from patchy reionization are coherent because the temperatures uh, fluctuate on, roughly on the scale of the ionized bubbles. And so that roughly corresponds to like 10 co-moving megaparsec scales. And so we might expect to see that this coherent temperature fluctuation may bring this excess large scale power um, due to the coherence. So uh, the questions for this project uh, are basically one, how does patchy reionization change the shape of the flux per spectrum? And then secondly, if we can detect this change in the shape of the flux per spectrum due to patchy reionization, then can we use this information to help us constrain the patchiness of reionization? So these are the questions of this project. And then what we did to answer these questions is that we ran radiation hydrodynamic simulations of reionization. So here on the bottom panel, uh, this is showing the visualization of the IgM temperature field at a shift 5.4. So basically we have different reionization scenarios and those cre uh, create different levels of temperature fluctuations in the IgM. So here in the top uh, leftmost panel, uh, this is a flash reionization simulation or uniform reionization. Uh, basically, we ionize the whole simulation box at a single reionization redshift. And then the IgM will basically follow a tight temperature density relation. And so in this case, we say there is no temperature fluctuation. And then in the other three panels, these are patchy reionization simulations. So we have different reionization scenarios and that uh, creates different levels of uh, temperature fluctuation in the post reionization IgM. So the uh, end product of all these is shown here. So this is showing the simulated flux per spectra in different simulations. So here are the points with error bars. These are the observational data points at redshift 5.4. The solid lines correspond to patchy reionization simulations. And then the solid, uh, sorry, the solid lines are patchy reionization simulations and the dashed lines are flash reionization simulations that we uh, set the reionization redshift to different values. In the bottom panel, you're seeing the fractional differences in the power spectra, all compared to this um, blue dashed line. So this is a flash reionization ions at redshift eight. So immediately you can see that in all of these patchy reionization simulations, there is this excess large scale power, uh, as we mentioned earlier, because of the coherent large scale uh, temperature fluctuations. 
And this effect is pretty large, something like uh, 20 to 60% level. So this is like the most evident imprint of patch ionization on the lemma of force flux per spectrum. And then on the small scales, it's pretty interesting that we found pretty negligible impact of temperature fluctuations on the shape of the small scale power. So I won't go into details of the, street, uh, the reason here, but we basically found a large cancellation between the effect of thermal broadening of the absorption lines and the uh, smoothing of the gas density due to thermal relaxation, or also called the pressure smoothing effect. Uh, but anyways, the, uh, the important thing to mention here is that uh, since the effect of temperature fluctuations is so small on the small scale power, that we can say that uh, temperature fluctuations from patch ionization is pretty unlikely to bias current uh, IGM temperature measurements or warm dark matter, fuzzy dark matter constraints uh, using re, uh, uniform reionization models. And then another thing to mention is that uh, also because of this very small, small scale effect of temperature fluctuations, the small scale shape of the power spectrum is mostly determined by the midpoint of reionization. And so what we can do is that we can fit the simulated power spectra to data and then see uh, which of the power spectra are favored by data to constrain the midpoint of reionization. And so we did, a, we did this exercise and we found that we can rule out the reionization redshift larger than eight models at about 0.5 sigma level using the small scale power. So that's basically the end of the story for this project. And then I also work on a bunch of different things uh, on reionization and also not related to reionization. Um, yeah, so if you're interested in any of these work, you uh, can talk to me later on. So uh, yeah, that's basically all I have to tell. Yeah, thank you. Very nice talk and thank you so much for staying on time. So I think we actually have five more minutes. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask both of our speakers. Did I kill all the questions? <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> I can think of one. Why did you only look at the 1D power spectrum for the force? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, you can you can also look at like other things. For instance, the what people usually look at is the uh, cumulative distribution function of the mean transmission. Yeah, so that's like the usual thing that people look at, but I think the uh, important motivation for looking at the power spectrum is like uh, when people do these IGM temperature measurements and warm dark matter, warm dark matter mass measurements, they assume uniform reionization models. And so we do want to understand why, uh, like whether temperature fluctuations may bias these measurements. So that's like a very important uh, reason for looking into this. <laughs>